Howdy gamers, it's Layton here from Layton Night, the podcast that you're currently listening to in case you accidentally stumbled upon this, in which case I am sorry, but just wanted to let you know that there is a video version of this episode that is up on our Patreon for all tiers. So if you want to join us over there, depending on the tier, you can get all sorts of cool benefits. We do mini-sodes every week. We do some fun videos. Uh, you get access to our fan discord. And overall, it's a really lovely time and we would love to have you there. So without any further ado, here is the audio version of this episode. So if you want to do the video version, you can go to patreon.com slash Leighton Knight, or not. Really, whatever floats your boat. Anyway, episode... All right, everybody, thank you for joining us here at Late Night 101. Please settle down. If you haven't found a seat yet, take a seat. There's plenty of seats up in the front here. In fact, nobody has sat in the first five rows, and I'd appreciate it if you just come up and fill out the space. We do have a long, arduous, and very, very boring class today. So come up. Let's get friendly. And as always, please, please don't hesitate to ask questions because I... I'm an open book. I wish some people would start showing up. I'm not taking questions yet. I wish some people would start showing up for office hours. I do have office hours once every fifth Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 7.35 a.m. So please show up for those. What time are your office hours? Okay, so I just said that. They are every fifth Thursday from 7.30 to 7.35 a.m. It's also on the syllabus, which I emailed to all of you, but only on your official late night university address. So it's not going to go to your, your Gmail. You have to access that account and find it. Yes. Yes. Question. Can I get another syllabus? I lost mine. Uh, I'm sorry. It, I can get the admins to send you another one, but that's already been emailed to you. So you just check your official school email and you'll be able to find it that way. Is that going to be on the test? Yes. That's definitely going to be on the test. Here, here's the thing. Everything's going to be on the test. Okay. So no more, no more questions about what's going to be on the test. Uh, but when's the test? So in typical British fashion, of course, you can tell from my accent, we are here in the United Kingdom at a British university or a uni, as we call it here. So the last class is in November and the exam is in June. So you have to remember everything you learned this semester for an additional six months before we examine you on it. Is that true? I'm slightly getting the dates off, but like in the British system, I think this is pretty much universal. All your exams are at the end of the year on everything. And so you can have a class that finishes in December, like a first semester class, and the exam isn't till like May. What if I don't remember any of this? Yeah, stuff? well, tough fucking luck. <laughs> and this is why it's the classic like British university thing to completely fuck around until April or whatever and then cram like nobody's business and try to absorb a year's worth of knowledge in a short space of time. Most students probably don't really do that, but it certainly does incentivize doing that. Also, remember, the drinking age is much younger in England. So just go hang out at the pub. Who, who the fuck cares? Your exam's not for a while. And these exams are also worth like 90% of your grade. So you can literally blow everything else off. In some cases, it's 100% of your grade. You can blow everything else off and then just show up for the exam. And if you crush it, you get a great grade. So does that mean that I don't have to do any of the homework? Depending on the class, yeah. Sometimes you don't have to do any of the homework and it just doesn't matter. Now, of course, it behooves me to point out that if you do the homework and come to class and pay attention and come to office hours, you will do better on the exam. Of course, of course you will. But no, technically speaking, you don't have to do anything. Okay, sick. So do I call you Mr. Wecht or Ninja Brian or Dr. Dr. Wecht? If we're going by my... Uh, title in the British system. I was a faculty member, but I was a lecturer, senior lecturer by the time I left. So you would just call me- A senior citizen? But <laughs> Dr. Wecht would be the appropriate title if we were using titles. I would not be allowed to, for example, call myself professor, even though that's what I would have been in the US. Because there, a professor is a particular rank of faculty member. Whereas in the US, they're all professors, but it's like assistant professor, associate professor, full professor. Whereas roughly speaking in England, it's lecturer, reader, professor. Okay, great. 
So are we going to learn about physician strats? Physician strats. That's right. <laughs> physician strats 101. Yeah, this is what this class is. I can't, what the fuck are we going to talk about? <laughs> We've completely abandoned the pretense of this being a fake class. <laughs> That's fine. Who cares? Yeah, I'm not sure that was really funny or interesting anyway. But when I was at Queen Mary, they'd have like prospective student days on Saturday. And you know what? I'm going to do for you what I would do for them. I wouldn't prepare anything. I would just show up and start talking and see where the discussion went. So, you know, I'm a theoretical physicist. I can talk about lots of different stuff. And so what I would start out, I would just start out with a question, which is, what is the universe made of? So, Layden, I ask you, oh God. what is the universe made of? Matter. Okay, great. So let's explore that because that's a great place to start. What do you mean by matter? What's matter? Uh, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Very nice. Very nice indeed. I don't have an actual answer to that question. Well, let's start somewhere. Give me one example of matter. El el elements. Elements. Okay, great. So what's an example of an element? For example, like uh, carbon, that's an element, right? Carbon is an element, yes. Carbon is, as we know, it is a thing that has, it has a nucleus, right, which has stuff in it, protons and neutrons. And then it has some electrons that orbit that nucleus. And then that carbon can bond with other stuff, including itself. Um, but carbon itself, if we're asking, you could go on and say, what is the fundamental nature of this thing? Carbon is not an indivisible unit, it has substructure, which you can delve down deeper. Wait, what's the structure of carbon? Well, it's a nucleus with electrons around it. The question always in science is, is there something more basic going on here? So it could be in principle that you've got all the elements in the universe, you know, hydrogen, helium, lithium, blah, blah, blah. And those are just all different things. And there's no unifying principle, right? It's just different stuff. It's earth, air, fire, water, you mush them together, and that's just what it is. But it turns out that all the elements on the periodic table have the same basic structure of a proton, and usually protons plus neutrons nucleus, surrounded by a bunch of electrons. So there's this common idea that it's a nucleus with electrons. Now you can ask, okay, well, what's up with this nucleus? If you didn't know anything about it, which people didn't for a long time, you know, you could say, well, are these all just different things or what? People knew they were charged, like, what's up with it? And it turns out that those have substructure of two different types of particles, depending on nucleus, how many of each, called protons and neutrons. So now we have three things that make up every element, protons, neutrons, and electrons. So strictly speaking, hydrogen doesn't have neutrons, but whatever. Why doesn't hydrogen have neutrons? Hydrogen is just a nucleus is a single proton and then it has one electron orbiting it. You can add neutrons to the nucleus to give you nuclei with the same charge, but different weights. And those are kind of different forms of hydrogen, but your basic garden variety hydrogen is just one proton, one electron. It's the simplest element in nature. By the way, people just tuning in have no idea why we're doing this. So that's fine. But this is not a typical late night episode. That's true. I've spouted off into lecturing about physics, but... Take a look at the title mm. and maybe have a little hint as yeah. to what the selected shtick for episode 101 is. Yeah. It's tremendously demeaning for you to call what I'm doing shtick, but let's move on. Dude, in therapy, like last week, I got my therapist to like call my personality a shtick. <laughs> it was devastating. <laughs> it's devastating. <laughs> you and your whole deal. <laughs> My, my whole deal. Like, how do we differentiate the shtick, the persona, and away from the trauma? Like, what, what is the authentic? It's like, mm -hmm. oh, gee, Jesus Christ, doctor. Yeah, wow. He also said that Dr. Melfi on The Sopranos is like a pretty good therapist, which I find a little sus, but. Hmm. Yeah, well, I don't know enough yet. Well, <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. Do you want me to continue with the physics thing or should I stop? I feel like that was enough physics. That was enough. But one point I do just want to make is that when you say the universe is made out of matter, the vast majority of what we understand the universe to be made out of is not matter and is in fact a total mystery. And this is what people call dark energy. Ooh. And moreover, in the matter portion of the universe, the vast majority of that, we don't know what it is, and that's called dark matter. So okay. 
the portion of the universe that we understand as what I would call baryonic matter, which is like stuff made out of the elements we know, is a teeny tiny fraction of what actually makes up the universe. And so if we ask, what's the universe made out of? The answer overwhelmingly is we have no idea. Sick. And that's pretty awesome. Who was like the OG physicist? God. (laughs) I mean, you're not wrong. No. Well, it depends what you mean, but... Like, who was the first guy who started being like, what the fuck is going on with things? A lot of stuff people trace back to Aristotle. And a lot of this stuff is just kind of wrong. There's like important physics principles from ancient Greeks. I'm sure there's lots of other stuff from other ancient cultures around. I mean, obviously China has a big scientific history too. The Arabic world has, you know, some big time ancient thinkers, but mostly physics is taught these days. You pretty much start with Newton, who was certainly not the first to think about a lot of stuff, but formulated his three laws of physics, which are kind of the starting point for a lot of what you learn these days. Those have direct ancestors in many, many other people. There's a famous quote, I forget exactly what it is, but Newton once said, if I have seen further, it's only because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Oh, that was him? That was him. That's fun. Yeah. So an influential person, but by no means the the first. But usually when people talk about standard usual physics, they pretty much start with Newton. It's so cool that all these old guys just kind of started figuring things out then. Like, that's amazing. It's pretty nuts. You know, most of what I did with physics was, you know, it was theoretical physics. It was math. And the language I used was something that, you know, they basically didn't have. Like, if you look at how Newton, for example, did math, it is not like the way we do math now. So Newton, basically at the same time as Leibniz invented calculus, And Newton's notation is not like Leibniz's notation kind of won. Newton's notation is not at all clear what's going on, (laughs) at least to me. Like, I'm sure he, very smart guy, knew what he was doing. But it is this amazing thing where we have developed this incredible calculational tool, which is modern mathematics, specifically calculus. And it works so fucking well. And it works so well that you can use it without thinking about what you're doing at every step. It's the equivalent of when you write two plus three equals five, you can write that and you don't have to interrogate, well, what do I mean by plus? Sure. Yeah. Like, what does that really mean? So you have a notational tool that works and a lot of modern research is possible because we have these very, very powerful notational tools, which sometimes break down, you know, uh, like if you set right two divided by zero, okay, you have to think about what that means. What does divided by mean in this case? What exactly are you trying to say? So sometimes notation breaks down. But my point in saying this was it's incredible what these early physicists and scientists did without knowing what we know now about modern mathematics, which is the language of physics. It's just astonishing. I mean, it's really, really impressive. So, and they just didn't know shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we know a lot of stuff now. And these early scientists just really didn't. Some of these people are operating thousands of years ago before we really understood anything about how the world works. It's just amazing. Are there any figures throughout physics history who are especially just weird? Like, does anybody stand oh, out? Oh, God, all of them. Yeah. There's a really interesting biography, actually, of Paul Dirac. Uh, he basically was one of the co-founders kind of founders of quantum mechanics in the early 20th century who was a very brilliant scientist and a very odd guy. And there's a biography of him by Graham Farmello called The Strangest Man, which is about Dirac and just his his being a weird genius. He had a famous thing where he was talking about trying to understand a specific kind of quantum mechanical equation, now called the Dirac equation. And he talks about gazing into the fire in Cambridge or, you know, something, and suddenly it came to him. And yeah. An odd dude, but a founder. And then you have your people like fucking Feynman, who's a very contentious figure right now. Important figure in the 20th century physics. Maybe not the best guy with women. Oh. Yeah. 
That's neat. But that's the history of everything these days, especially figures who are well documented in the 20th century, especially, you know, powerful white men who, when you really start interrogating how they were, often do not come across looking so great. Yeah, not the best in pretty much all respects and hasn't been the best forever. Yes. You know, th these things are hard to say, right? Like, it's all historical yeah. stuff. Records aren't necessarily that great. You can't deny their contributions to science. You know, it's like Columbus, right? You have to recognize that there's something important that happened there. In Columbus's case, I can't believe we're talking about this. It is just unambiguous that the guy was a complete piece of shit. Like, yeah, no one really disputes that historically. Like, he kept records. The guy just sucked. It was awful. Receipts on himself. Yeah, which is crazy because, if you know, that's a long fucking time ago now. But when you ask, like, what are the figures in physics, especially 20th century people, people do not look so great with a modern lens much of the time. Yeah, I mean, same can be said of a lot of, like, writers in the 20th century. I mean, like, really anyone. But I started reading, you know, into Philip K. Dick's background because there's a lot of the stuff about, like, his very bizarre, like, spiritual sort of schizoaffective uh -oh. experiences that mm -hmm. informed a lot of his work, especially Vallis, which is like partially autobiographical, but also like Jesus Christ, his relationships with the women. Was he a Philip K. total dick? Philip K. complete, wildly awful dick. Really? Yeah, very bad. Like too much for me to say on this show. Okay, yeah. It's a fun little Wikipedia uh, scroll through. It has now gotten to a point where if I don't know something about a famous figure, I just kind of assume they weren't that great, right? Yeah, it's like all of them were anti-Semitic and not great with women. And Yeah. Anyway, that's men for you. Hell yeah, it is. <laughs> Are there any things in physics that have like really bizarre names? Oh, I mean, everything. It depends what you mean by bizarre. Just sort of like we had that mini semi recently where we were talking about dick shrooms and whatnot. Yes. Subscribe to our Patreon to hear us talk about dick shrooms. <laughs> well, there's the Mixmaster universe. <laughs> Mixmaster was a physicist. He had some general relativistic structure to space time that I forget exactly what it is, but I do remember once seeing the title of a paper, which was The Mixmaster Universe is Chaotic. And I was like, fuck yeah, it is. Hell yeah. There's the Fokker-Planck equation. <laughs> is that spelled how it sounds? It is F-O-K-K-E-R, like the German aircraft, and Planck, or Planck probably. Max Planck was a famous physicist. I mean, that Fokker-Planck is a big-time equation, which you hear a lot about. Oh, do you know what a vector is? Explain. A vector is basically an arrow. It is a thing that has a length that points in a particular direction. That's actually, by the way, that's not true. Why is that not true? Why are we whispering? But, well, because secret? that's the way you're taught what a vector is in like high school when you learn vectors. But really, really, a vector is a thing that transforms in a particular way under coordinate transformations. No one says that in high school, but that's actually a better way of thinking of what a vector is. So hmm. that's a whole deal that has to do with differential geometry and thinking about physics in different coordinate frames. But if you learn that a vector is just like, it's a four component thing in space time, three space, one time, every set of numbers you write down is not really a vector. It has to be a thing that transforms in a particular way. Interesting. Yeah. When I learned that, it blew my fucking mind. This thing that I thought I understood, and this happens all the time in life, but also in science and physics, you're like, oh, this is how, what I thought this was. What? That was like, a vast oversimplification. And in fact, it's nothing like that. It's wild. So I remember being very confused. I was like, I just can't write down a set of four numbers. That's a vector. That's not true. It's not true. Wow. And the reason is it's important that you know how things transform so that physics can be the same in all coordinate frames. So you're constantly asking, hey, if I rotated everything by whatever, 90 degrees, the laws of physics shouldn't change, right? If I move my entire frame, now it's going significant fraction of the speed of light faster. Once I'm at a constant speed, physics should be the same. So you have to ask if the laws of physics are invariant under all these transformations. And so you have to know what transforms how. Awesome.
Anyway, this happens all the time, and it really is a paradigm shift, but it's often not presented that way because people are so used to it that they're just like, oh, that's what a vector is, and they forget to say, hey, fuck nuts. You don't know what a vector is. So, I should really work fuck nuts into the lexicon. I feel like I don't hear that one enough. It's my new thing. <laughs> my new catchphrase. Anyway, everybody, this is Late Night with Brian Wacht. Over here we have Leighton Gray. Oh, that's me. That other one was Brian Wacht. Yes. And this is episode 101, Late Night 101, and we're teaching you about stuff. And teaching each other. And teaching each other. Because aren't we all students of life, man? Yeah, that's really crazy when you think about it. Yeah. So do you know much about John Singer Sargent? Uh, I know he's an Ashcan school because my great uncle or whatever he was, was in that school and a contemporary of his. So Mm -hmm. I know his works kind of through studying family history, but I don't know anything about the guy personally. I just know about the general paintings of common people kind of Ashcan school movement. Yeah. So he's one of my favorite painters, really, really beautiful, like chunks of color and brushwork. I'm going to talk about probably his most famous painting and one that you've probably seen, which Mm -hmm. is Portrait of Madam X. Are you familiar? This one I know. Yep. Yeah. So Singer Sargent was popping off and he was doing a salon in France to show off his latest piece. And the painting that we see now, like I've seen it in person, uh, it's a little different than how it was. What's at the map? Yeah. Very beautiful. Very large. One of my favorites. Just the best. And so when he unveiled this painting, everyone lost their fucking minds. It basically ruined his career in France and he had to move and went straight into like doing commission portraits of rich people. They hated it. They hated it. Lost their minds in a bad way. Yeah. And so in the initial painting, one of the straps of her dress was down. Mm. She's very pale. She's very deathly looking. And at the time, like... Painting people very rosy and alive was sort of the deal. And so for everyone to see this lady who looks kind of like she's dead, who's wearing this, you know, deep gown with the strap falling off, like there are so many like little sexual things hidden in paintings. There's the really famous Fragonard woman on a swing painting and like her slippers coming off in that painting. And there's a guy who's like kind of aimed to be looking at her dress. People interpret it as being very, very sexual. Mm -hmm. So that one was also really controversial. Can't get away from foot talk. You're the one who brought up feet. But yeah, Singer had a really hard time after this one and repainted over it so the strap wasn't falling down. And yeah, I wrote a paper about this in college and now I don't remember any of it. Was there a specific person who modeled it? Do we know that? Yes. And it also caused a lot of problems for her because people perceived the painting as, this is just the word that I'm using, very Mm whorish, which also ignores the long, long history of sex workers being hired to be models for paintings, like many Mm -hmm. of the most famous ones. That's just kind of the deal. So yeah, he just kind of slunk away from France and it was a big problem. It's a gorgeous painting. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then I guess most of the stuff I know of his is from when he was in America later, like early 20th century. I'm looking up, this painting is 1884. So I think most of the stuff I know, because it relates to what my uncle did, is like early 20th century stuff, not the late 19th. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I love about his paintings is that the planes are so defined by like hue and color, but he would make like, one brush stroke, go across the room and just stare at it for an extended period of time. Speaking of a paradigm shift, I remember when I realized how fucking hard it is to do that, to be able to take paint. What kind of paints did they use? Oil. Okay, oil. Or tempera, maybe. Yeah, so I I don't know anything about it. But to be able to get the colors exactly right and the shading and just every single fucking aspect of it I don't have an art brain. It never really hit me. And then I remember, I don't think it was any particular moment, but at some point being like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because you walk through these art museums and you're like, yeah, painting, 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 painting. It's fucking easy. Look at all of them, right? All these people do paintings. How hard could it be? And then you take a moment to like sit in front of one and look at it, especially when you can get up close enough to really see the textures. And it's just astonishing. Who did the Dorian Gray one that's at the Art Institute of Chicago? Ivan Albright. I have an Albright who I don't know anything about. That's tight. I've somehow never seen this before. Oh, really? It's very, very famous. 
And it's so great. But I remember standing in front of that in Chicago and being like, fuck, this looks hard. I took a semester-long oil painting class in a room that was not properly ventilated, which was oh, absolute hell. Because, you know, using some very strong chemicals there. And I would hell just, yeah. like, get a headache. But the thing about oil is that it stays wet for so long. And so in that class, we had drawers where we would keep our glass palettes because you kind of have to use glass uh, and scrape them off. But the palettes, like the globs of paint, would stay wet wet for— Oh, oh, wait, they would stay what? Uh, Wet. No, you said whacked. I heard you say whacked. Don't gaslight me, bro. Hell yeah. You said stay whacked. Stay whacked, bro. (laughs) So it'll be workable for a long time, but that also means that your painting is going to stay wet. So imagine having to bike around the campus with a wet painting. And if you get that oil paint on your clothes, it is never coming out. Oh, yeah. So I had a dedicated pair of paint jeans, which were, Mm -hmm. of course, very art student of me. And a really big part of like why some of the hues in these paintings are so beautiful is because the thing that you can do with oil paint is glazes where you're thinning it out with Mm -hmm. uh, linseed oil something like that. And you're like layering these glazes and painting on top of it. So you get like a real depth of the Mm -hmm. color. And, you know, you got to shell out for the really nice oil paints. I was always very fond of my Illusorin Crimson. Mm -hmm. Thallo Blue. Thallo, did you say? Yeah. I forget the full word, but it's like Mm P-T-H. So yeah, oil painting is really fun. But when you see like how long you have to work on something and if you've done a really dark area and you need to go put highlights in there, you got to wait like days, a week to go fix it. Like it is a real pain in the ass and I never want to work with it again. (laughs) Because we had to do some fat paintings too, like an 18 by 24 for a final. When you look at the paintings that, you know, the masters did, where it's like they spent a year on this. It completely makes sense because of how long you have to be working it. And even when you finish it, you still have to wait forever for it to dry. Yeah. But because of how workable it is, like if you paint with acrylic paint or gouache, which I really like, those things are drying up midway through your painting session. You can use like fluid retarder to keep it liquid. Physical painting is so difficult. And then don't even get me started on watercolor because I used to do a ton. I would do like little art shows and sell my watercolor paintings. Wow. Seems real drippy. It's very drippy. And I leaned into that because I would do a blow dryer. So I'd do really big areas and then hit it really hard so it would splatter. Oh, that's cool. But it's so unforgiving. It's really rough because it's like you got to use a frisket, which is a little like fluid. It's my new dating app. (laughs) Frisket. (laughs) Yeah, that's perfect. For when you're feeling frisky. Yeah, yeah. And want some brisket. I'm always feeling frisky and want brisket. Anyway, but frisket is sort of like a a rubbery substance. And so you paint it on and you have to have a dedicated frisket brush because it will ruin any brush. But with that down, you can watercolor over it and then peel it off. It's really fun to peel off. Hmm. It's sort of like when you get glue on your hands and you can peel it off, but it makes it so that the paint doesn't get into that spot. So you can do a lot of really fun masking with it. So that's my talk about paintings. Wow, cool. Shall we take a break to hear from our guest lecturer? I think that's a great idea. So everybody, we have a world expert in gaming joining us now. I don't think I'm going to introduce them. I think I'm just going to let them start talking. We pre-recorded this one segment and we're going to put it in right now. And listen, you're going to learn. That's all I'm going to tell you ahead of time. Like you might think, you know, video games, but you don't have the breadth of experience the insight, the sheer gaming talent that this next person has. So get ready because you're going to be a different person when you come out the other side. Hello. (gasps) (laughs) Hey, Odds. Hi, Raven. What Zelda game do you want to hear about? I really like Breath of the Wild. I know you like Breath of the Wild, right? I know, like... Everything about mm. Breath of the Wild. You do? Okay, well, teach us. Can you tell us some tricks about Breath of the Wild? You can ride Lino's backs, and if you hit them while you're riding their backs, you won't lose any weapon damage. A weapon that's near breaking, it won't break because you won't lose uh, any weapon damage if you're sitting on Lino's back and hitting it. Really? Yes. No weapon damage at all. Wow. And are Lionels normally very easy to beat? They're very, very hard. If you play in master mode, then all the silver enemies turn to gold enemies. They do? Yes. They're hit by 
Ganon's lightning, if people think, and then they'll turn to very higher level enemies. So in the early game, red enemies are blue enemies. Wow. So try to avoid fighting with anything. Mm-hmm. And the easiest way to trap a Lionel is to take it to the water, put three ice blocks around it, and then just jump onto its back and keep hitting it until it dies. Wow, because you could trap it. Yeah, you trap it. It can run off on land, but if you put it in the water, it can't do that. Mm -hmm. That is smart. Any other tips against enemies in Breath of the Wild? Any other tips? If you're fighting a Lazawful skull, they'll try to do the classic tongue attack and then their tail attack. But when they do the tongue attack, this is what happens when they do the tongue attack. Because they have no more tongue because they're skulls. So they'll swing their <laughs> bone tail. And then when they try to do the tongue attack, you can just stay there because you won't have to jump back because this is what they're doing. It's like they're asking you to give them something to eat. That's very silly. <laughs> no, because they don't have a sword. And then you just give them your sword to you eat. You give them a tree branch. That's bad. You can give them a tree branch? Do <laughs> you think they'd like that to eat? Mm-hmm. Um, you can ride the Lord of the Mountain. What's the Lord of the Mountain? Remind me what that is. Well, sometimes you can see this glowing blue light fly up from... Oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh -huh. And if you go up to that mountain, yeah, you'll see the Lord of the Mountain. Is that me? People used to call me that. No. Oh. It's um a dead thing. Mm -hmm. So a thing died on that mountain, and now it protects all the animals. So, like, if a hunter comes, a hunter came, if you ask him, he said, I went to that mountain... And then the Lord of the Mountain came up to him and stopped him from killing any of the animals mm -hmm. because his job is to protect all the animals of the mountain. Mm -hmm. So don't try to hit any of those glowing things. But if you shoot one of the glowing things, they'll leave rubies behind. Mm. Ooh. That's cool. What about finding Koroks? In the beginning of the game, you don't need to really, but I accidentally fell into a pool. I accidentally fell into one of them and got a Korok seat. You fell into a, a pool and found a I found, you know those um, rivers I all the way? Uh -huh. And there's some with flower circles where you have to land. Do you mm -hmm. get a cork seed? I was walking off a cliff and it fell well, into okay, one of right those. There, right there, that might have been your problem. You were walking <laughs> off a cliff. And I fell into one of those and then I got a cork seed and that was my very first cork seed. Do you know how many cork seeds are in the game? No. It was like 900 or something. No. Isn't there like 999? Or something like that? Uh, I was going to say like 300, but that would just be a guess. Audrey, I really like the Korok, so that's like my favorite part of the game. I just go up on a mountain and like paraglide off and look at stuff. That's a fun way to do it, yeah, right? Yeah, but I, when I finished my four shrines, instead of getting hearts, I got stamina. That's smart. Mm -hmm. Because you really want to use your paraglider when you first yeah. get it. Like I just climbed up something, something very small and paraglided off it just for the fun of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like one of the best parts of the game. It really sucks when you're running out of stamina when you're like climbing a cliff. It's very frustrating. I was watching a video and it showed me if you have two of those green mushrooms and cook them together, mm -hmm. they'll make a meal that gives you a lot more stamina. Mm -hmm. Do you like cooking in the game? I'm just starting, but I really think it's really part. Plus, if you cook in the blood moon, your meal will totally be a success because it's really good. If you oh, cook, really? Like, it's stronger during the blood yes. moon? If you cook it during the blood moon, but not like after Zelda talks, but before Zelda talks, between the timeline, your food will actually be very good. Oh, so it's like a little glitch in the game. Mm -hmm. So like if you cook a stealth thing, mm -hmm. and that's one, it'll probably like become two stealth. Ooh. So you'll get a better range of things if you cook near the blood moon. Mm -hmm. Audrey, have you found the Master Sword? No. Did you know that the Master's, there's a glitch that the Master Sword returns to the forest? It does? Yeah, there's a glitch that you can do, and you just let go of the Master Sword, I think, and it just flies, and you can watch it go right you back. You can watch it fly? No, it goes, like, flies, and then right back to the forest, and then when you come to the forest, it's in the pedestal. It is. Yes. Were you? And Yiga and Yiga, Yiga Blade Masters can actually take the Master Sword out of the pedestal. They can? Yeah. That doesn't sound good. They shouldn't have that. <laughs> but you can just lead them in. No baddies can go into the Enchanted Forest. No, wait, wait. wait. No, no baddies can? No, no enemies can be in the Enchanted Forest. But if you lead them in with bombs, square <laughs> bombs, they really like picking things up. Not their things. They like picking them up. So just... Leave a trail of bombs like crumbs for a mouse, and then they'll get to the master sword and they'll be like, "Ooh!" And they'll oh. just and they'll do this. 
Oh, wow. takes Master Sword. <laughs> and you can also sneak the Master Sword out of the pedestal by making a campfire right next to the Master Sword, looking up, selecting wait until morning, and then it'll just say, do you want to pick up the Master Sword? And you can hit yes. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> like, literally. Listen, how do you know so much about this I watched game? lots of Zelda videos. Yeah, like what? About Breath of the Wild. Who do you like? Celtic. Who, who would you say is your favorite YouTuber? And there's a very obvious answer to this that I'm looking for. <laughs> Celtic? No, no, not Celtic. Who else? Who else is your favorite? GameSpot. YouTuber? Not GameSpot. There's another person in particular I'm thinking That's of. That's the only that one that does I stuff really. on YouTube. There's someone else you know who puts videos on YouTube. Like okay, Thank that's a good you, answer. Honey. That's a that good means a answer. Lot to me. It's not the particular It's totally answer. not daddy. <laughs> oh, okay, well, at least, at, least, at least you ruled it out, you silly kid. Audrey, you know a lot more about Zelda than I do, but my only tip is if you go to get the Master Sword and you're in the Enchanted Forest, the way that you find it is you follow the wind because it listen, takes yeah, to what she, um, listen to what yeah. she's saying. But I watched you... it in a video. <laughs> follow where the, if you hold a torch, follow where the bristles go. You follow yeah. that to find that that's how you do it. Mm-hmm. And watch that. This is the only Zelda game you really know stuff about, right? No! <laughs> what, what other games do you know stuff Wind about? Wind Waker. Yeah, what else? Just Ocarina of Time. Yeah, but that's it. That's got to be it. No. What else? Spirit Tracks. Yeah. You definitely don't know anything about that game where... Terror a... Sword. Oh, I was going to say the game mm. where the sword points to the sky. <laughs> and what about Lynx? Lynx Awakening. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I'm watching a walkthrough while playing the game. So I don't even have to figure out anything. I'm just like, okay, you're going there. I'm moving here. I'm moving here. And you. <laughs> I do that too, Audrey. And I accidentally paid my money when I didn't need to. I got more potion. Um, I got In more what? magic. In what game? Link's In Awakening. What? Okay. I got more magic powder, <laughs> but I didn't need it. Uh huh. I really didn't. Uh, what would you say is your favorite? of the Zelda games that you've seen? Maybe Breath not that you've played, but that you've seen. Right now, it's kind of between Breath of the Wild, Skyward Sword, and Twilight Princess. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Twilight Princess. I'm watching Twilight Princess walkthrough. I like watching oh. walkthroughs of lots of Zelda games so I can know them all. Layton, what was your first Zelda game that you played? It was Breath of the Wild. That was my first game! Hey. You guys have so much in common. You Actually, totally I think that no, no, <laughs> Skyward Sword was my first game. No, it Skyward, wasn't. Yes, it was. Breath of the honey, we had Breath of I the Wild. I didn't before. play Breath of the Wild. I let you walk around though. You would walk around and ride the motorcycle. And Does stuff. not count. Okay, I'm just saying when you were. A I'm big, saying the first game I'm playing by myself is Skyward Sword. Oh, okay, that's a different thing. That's a that's because a that was the first game I started. I always start games after you start them. Yeah. Well, you need a true gamer to show you how it's done, right? <laughs> I just want to see how hard it is. Uh-huh. That's fair. And what to do. That's true. Did you know they refer to me as a master gamer? You can play master mode. Yeah, I, I could, of course, if I felt like it. <laughs> now do it now. No, I'm, I'm recording with Layton right now. You know, I'm kind of busy Is at it about to turn off screen? And then don't turn off the screen. <laughs> Audrey, so all of the Zelda games look really different. Is there one that you like the art or like the look of the best? Breath of the Wild cover. You like the, the cover of Breath of the it's Wild. It's really pretty. It's really pretty. But what about it in is. the game itself, the way when you're playing the game, it looks it really, on the screen? It's Same really one? nice. Do you think Wind Waker Link is cute? Do you like Link and mm -hmm. Wind Waker? Yeah, she's a baby. What do you think of the really old Zelda, like the first Zelda, the way it looks? I've Do never you, done it. You've seen me play it. We played it. Remember? We started mm. playing it a little bit together. I only really saw in a few clips. And the most thing I've saw of it is the man saying it's dangerous to go alone. Because that's <laughs> basically the only thing I've saw of it uh -huh. that I remember. Uh huh. It's pretty memorable. But what do you think? Do you like the way that looks? Or no, not so much? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Link has an Octorok on the side of his shorts. Where and where? In Breath of the Wild. Oh, Before you get okay. any clothes. He does, yeah. He has a little Octorok. He does. Why do you think they're called Octoroks? I've never been able to figure it out. They're octopuses that shoot rocks at Oh my you. gosh, you just broke this whole case wide open. Did you know Octoroks can actually polish shiny um, old weapons? So if you have a rusty weapon, throw it on an Octorok when it's sucking in air. And it'll spit it out to you, but it can still damage really? you. But you, you wow. grab it, and it's nice and shiny new. Well, it's oh, so that's why in Hyrule Warriors, you can octopolish a thing, huh? 
I didn't. I, well, when you go to the blacksmith guild, mm -hmm. you can octo polish a weapon, I, and I guess that's why I didn't know that. Because if you throw it in Breath of the Wild, if you throw it at an octo rock on the second end, it polishes your weapon. Mm -hmm. So it means they give your weapon to an octo rock and polish but, it. Wait, octo rocks are mean. Why would you want to give them a weapon? You throw them a rusty weapon, and then they make it better. Yeah, but wouldn't you be worried they would like chase after you with the weapon or something? No. What do you think about choo choos? What's your take on choo choos? Are very annoying, especially the elementrical ones because the elementrical ones. Yes, the element ones elemental. because in Age of the Calamity, I was rolling bombs at choo choos because I did not want to get fired. In Goron's Druk Goron Hero, I did not want to get fired, so I just ruled bombs at them. Oh, that's a good idea. Then most people still don't know that the choo choos weak spot is their eyes. I didn't know that. Yeah, really? They're weak spots their eyes. Wow. They're two big eyes. Now, here's something I've been meaning to ask. It's like the only real part of the body they have. That's true. So you mentioned Daruk. Who's Daruk? Daruk's the Goron warrior. Yeah, he's real tiny. He's giant, literally, mister. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is Daruk's favorite thing to eat? Rocks. Nice and loud, remember talking They about. eat rocks. Who? Gorons? Gorons. So sometimes I tell you Daruk and Link stories, right? What? Rock roast. Yeah, what about it? <laughs> That's what Daruk likes, I think. Because he gave Link rock roast, and Link actually tried to eat it. Yeah. Like, literally. It's made of rocks, and you actually heard crunching. Impa and Zelda, you could see their faces going, like, <laughs> what are you doing even? I really like Impa. Daruk, I like Impa too. I really like that Daruk is always like, well... Yeah. That's actually why I do it on Iris and Elena. That's don't hit your friends. I don't though, go okay? very hard. I go. Okay. <laughs> Wait, you do it because Daruk does it? Yes, yeah, because Daruk <laughs> does it all the time to Link. He does all that. Right, well, and then, and then just Link's, to be clear, he don't hit people, He hits right? him on the shield, and then Link just stumbles forward. Did you hear the thing I said yes. about hitting people? <laughs> he, okay, good. he just bends down and stumbles forward. Because mm -hmm. Do you know anyone that tells you really funny Zelda stories? Hmm. Like really funny story, uh, very inventive, very creative. Well, probably not dead. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it sounds no. like your mom's the one who does that. No, actually, what? she does really good princess stories. What's a princess story? Princess Peach and Mario story. But I'm usually now Toadette. <laughs> You're usually Toadette. You get to yes. play Toadette. Mommy doesn't just tell you stories. You and Mommy act out princess yes, stories together, right? But she also makes up scenes. Can I use the restroom real quick? Yes. And what? Be very what? Be quiet and be very Zelda -y. Don't talk this out loud. Be very Zelda y. Shut! Say <laughs> she, Mr. Poo Poo. Don't call me Mr. Poo Poo. <laughs> now listen, Audrey, are you coming back? Yes. Okay. Does she still have the AirPod? Oh, wait, do you still have the AirPod in your ear? Bye bye. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. <laughs> it's going to disconnect at some point. Audrey, do you read? <laughs> Such is life. Connected. I know. That's why I told you to leave it here. Shows. The goal here was odds to have you teach Leighton a thing or two about Zelda. What, I did. Well, yes, I know. But I'm saying, Leighton, do you have any questions for Audrey about... Your favorite about, Zelda game. About or, any anything. You any, know, uh, anything or anything Zelda related. I have a question. Audrey, do you think that Zelda and Princess Peach would be friends? I've been playing things with their friends. Best friends in Mario and Link are best friends, too. I like that. What do you Actually, think? Actually, me and Caleb were playing things where Urbosa's evil and, and so was Zelda. <laughs> Urbosa and Zelda were evil? Yes, we're getting into Mice's garden. <laughs> what do you think uh, Peach and Zelda would like to do together? Like, what's something they would do as friends? Like a friend hang? Um, fight. Fight? Tiny enemies? Fight tiny enemies. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's fun. All the time in Age of the Calamity, if you fight like Bokoblins, they actually give you output, which gives you an A button, which is really good. So if I'm like fighting a big boss, like a Hinox, I'll leave two of my characters, or at least one of my characters doing it, and then I'll go and get output and come back and I'll leave as another character. <laughs> I just, I'll leave the boss. Like when I had to defeat a guardian or bring a guardian to me, I didn't want to lose any hearts, so I just made my two characters bring the guardian. I did not even <laughs> try. I was just like, you, you can draw paths for where your character should go. 
Mm-hmm. Like the characters you're not playing. Because you can't just like put your remotes down and then they walk. If you're playing the character, they are not going to do it. You have to walk them. I have a question for you. What do you think Breath of the Wild 2 is going to be like? What do you oh, think? I've seen a lot of trailers. Okay, tell me. Talk to me and Layton about them. Link can finally skydive and he can actually go through um cliffs. He can go through cliffs? Through yes, cliffs? as long as they're flat. Like a cliff that looks like this. Mm-hmm, that's he, tilted. He can't go through it. Okay. Like, no, like if it's this, oh, like it's, this, yeah, uh-huh. he totally can't go through that. Okay. But if it's like kind of like this, mm-hmm. he can go right through it. Yeah. It has to be like a point. It can't okay. be a point. Like something like a hill. He passes through the cliff? Yeah, he can go through a cliff finally. Wow. Whoa. It's like if you're in the on the ground and then there's a cliff here and there's like a flat side here and a flat side here. He goes right through it. Wow. And, ends up and that top. was in the trailer, huh? Yes. A trailer that I kind of saw. But if it's like this, if it's like this, he won't be able to go through it. Wow. Hmm. Um, what else is going to be in the game? Anything that you know for sure? Paragliding is going to be back. And it looks like these islands are going to be like the shrine walls where you can't climb them. Like shrine walls where you can't climb yeah, them? Yeah, you can't climb them. Oh. Some people wanted Breath of the Wild to have more dungeons. The four divine beasts, they said just felt like giant shrines. Uh-huh. They wanted some more, like, typical Zelda-y kind of dungeons, huh? Yeah, like, they wanted the hookshot to be involved, too. They oh, wanted I see. a classic Zelda item, the hookshot. The classic shot. Zelda mm. item, the hookshot. And there was yeah. also no, um, slings things. The slingshot? The slingshot. That wasn't involved either. Uh-huh. Oh, they wanted a slingshot. I see. No, I'm just saying, they didn't use as many typical, always Zelda items, like the well, that I think that's a good thing, though, slingshot. right? Because you got to change it up, right? Isn't it nice to have a difference sometimes? What do you think? I just, Do you think they should have had it, or are you glad the way it is? I am happy the way it is, but I kind of feel like I at least had one real Zelda item. That's like the hookshot. He said the hookshot shouldn't be involved because it would make it easier to climb from place to place, right? Mm-hmm. And the thing is about how can you get places he, and what you should get. Here's another question I have for you. Talk to me about mm-hmm. Ganon. Super good guy, right? Like really nice and friendly. You are stupid. Polite. I'm What? You're stupid. Don't call me stupid, please. <laughs> then say the truth about what you think. What do we not call people? Stupid. Yeah. You're foopid. Well, that doesn't actually make it better. It makes it cuter. Anyway, <laughs> what I was saying about Ganon is he seems to me... No. Like, just let me finish. You don't know what I'm going to say. He seems to me like You're just taking too a long. very kind Bad. guy. He's Wrong. A, he's a good cook. Wrong. He's a good friend. He's good Wrong. with kids. Wrong. He has some really good ideas for the future of Hyrule. Wrong. Ideas that you should give him a chance to implement before you judge them. You have to admit that. You have to give him a chance. Wrong. Right? We already have gave him a chance, and he tried to eat Zelda. He actually swallowed Zelda. Yeah, well, I mean, who, you, like, <laughs> it was one mistake. You, no, he did gonna, on purpose. It's going to happen. Then why did he just try to get her out? I think he's a good guy. We're actually hanging out next weekend. We're going to go get brunch. Together in West Hollywood. I'm stopping you from doing that. You're going to stop me from having brunch with my best friend, Ganon? With the rudest person in the world. Yes. I'm, I am not the rude. <laughs> I'm not the one who's interrupted me to tell me Zelda facts. And now this is my talk. It's your talk? Hey, it's my <laughs> show. My name's in the title. <laughs> my name should be replaced. I agree. You think it should be late in night with Audrey Wecht? Yes. I think actually that's a pretty great idea. It would look better on the sign. Do you and have- also, we could do Zelda facts all the time. I would love that. But you don't like talking about Zelda. Any last tips or tricks to an aspiring Zelda player before you go? Because you have to go get ready for bed. I love you. That's a good tip. I love you, Audrey. Oh, you can make rice balls. In the game or in real life? Yes. In the game, you can make rice balls. But you love rice balls in real life too, yes. right? What's your favorite thing to have in a rice ball? Uh, tuna mayo. Tuna mayo. We love. Oh, that's good. Tuna mayo rice balls. All right. What, bye. Bye. Well, you have one last catchphrase, one no. last thing to say no. to everybody. No. Good night. Bye. 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 Okay. So we're back. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed that lecture. I did. I did too. And I'm the one who got called stupid like six times. She loves to dunk on you. <laughs> she, does, she does it all the time. And she has such a great delivery with it. The very sarcastic. It's great. I really appreciate her just saying that I'm her favorite YouTuber because that's totally what I am. (laughs) 
<laughs> I could see that it took her a minute to catch on to what I was doing there. And yeah. once she got it and realized she had some power to not say what I wanted her to say, oh, it's great. That kid rules. Yeah, she's the greatest. All right, what are we doing next? Well. Is this time for what I have beneath me here? Yes. So, Brian. Yes. Do you want to look cool as fuck? Cooler as fucker? I already see your Weird Al shirt, so yeah. That's right. I'm what they call hip. It's weird to see you in a white shirt. I feel like you usually go for darker stuff. Well, it's blue, actually. You can't really tell because I'm so blown out. Oh. You're right. I do normally go for darker stuff, but this is what I put on this morning. Yeah. I just need clothes that I can spill coffee on as I do every morning. (laughs) That's why I'm wearing this fucked up mushroom sweater. Well, of course, once you become a parent, that's every piece of clothing you have, and then you just don't give a single shit. Yeah. So Very true. Everything you own becomes a feces magnet for a period of time. So you're like, well- Who cares? It's all going to get shit on. Yeah, it don't matter. Yep. What did I find on eBay that was so great? I have a search saved for vintage Blockbuster. Yes. And there was this amazing Blockbuster shirt that was like a combo dare Blockbuster thing. Like D-A-R-E dare? Yes. Okay. And it was double extra large, which is my favorite. And... It had like the grossest, hu- it was white and it had the grossest, hugest stain. Otherwise, I absolutely mm. would have bought that. That's kind of dope though. Like a really gross stain that adds so much to a shirt. <laughs> I'm adding a third Blockbuster mug to my collection because it's a crossover oh, yeah. Blockbuster and Adam's Family Values mug. Wow. And it was like $5. <laughs> there was also for $1,000, you can cop a thank you for shopping at Blockbuster huge sign that would like go in the window. Oh God, wow, amazing. That's too much money for anything, but God yeah. damn, that would be the coolest thing to have. Yeah. Anyway, so we're going back to you looking sharp as hell. Yep, 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 on board. You know, I'm always looking to up my style game as it is. Yes. So I'm open to suggestions. So a thing that I do very often is winged eyeliner. And today I would like to teach you how to do winged eyeliner and a little bit of mascara. Great. Now I should tell people, although we've said it before, we do have a video version of this episode. Yes. So if you jump onto our Patreon, you'll be able to see me doing this. But just imagine in your head that Brian's wings are completely on point. So the wing thing is the thing that you often do where you have like little things coming off the sides here. That's called winged. As I'm wearing right now, yes. You're so pixelated, I can't see. Same, I also can't see you very well, which (laughs) makes this extra great. And you don't have a mirror, so you're only using your webcam, which is expert mode. Which is very small. So I've been doing eyeliner since I was 15. And I think the thing when you start doing winged liner is you got to give yourself like five years because it's going to look like shit. I mean, that's probably not true. I think with the amount of like makeup, YouTube, and people's skills, I'm sure they can get it like amazing mm-hmm. out the gate. First, obviously this look has stuck for you, and I think it looks great, but what, what do you, you like about it? When I don't have makeup on, I kind of feel like a 12-year-old. So if I do nothing else, I will put on my eyebrows because, you know, I'm blonde. They're very light. But that's the thing about makeup. When you're an artist, like it's just do it on your face. Once you get the hang of it, it's really satisfying to do. Mm-hmm. And if you look like a bad bitch, so. <laughs> Typically, when I see you do your makeup, at least like standard makeup, it's noticeable, but not overwhelming. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I yeah. can tell you're wearing makeup, but it's not like, whoa, that's a lot. Yeah. Which is not a judgment, by the way, on people who do oh, wear yeah. a lot of makeup. It's just, I'm Stating what I'm saying, yeah. It's because I'm lazy and it's way easier. (laughs) Like now I only do my eye area. I don't need to do anything else unless I'm getting fancy with it. But it's because I have a terrible habit of going to sleep in my makeup, which I've largely kicked. But Mm -hmm. it's less bad when you're not wearing like foundation, concealer, eyeshadow. If I wear eyeshadow to bed, I wake up the next morning and I look like I am stoned as fuck. (laughs) It messes up my eyes Because it irritates your eyes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially with contact lenses, which I did wear for like a good period of time and only stopped because one folded up in my eye while I was driving, which was a nightmare. But makeup and contacts, I respect the hell out of people who do it because it's so much happening to your eyes. The foundation, I've always been curious because I read the books, 
but I didn't see the TV series. And there was like very little makeup mentioned in the books. So why are people so interested in in this sci-fi makeup? I don't even know the thing that you're referencing. It's Asimov's Foundation uh, series. Yeah, sorry. It was a really good joke. Yeah, I believe you. Another thing, like when you're starting out, finding the right shade of foundation is very difficult because people have undertones and you have to find one that it doesn't feel cakey or like you're suffocating your pores because that's a bad feeling. You want something that's lightweight. This is why I use a BB cream, which is a much lighter, it's got like a little bit more moisturizer and a little less pigment. This is it cosmetics cc cream if anybody's interested it's the best foundation bb cream i've ever used so you asked me to get two different things epic ink liner black do you see the brand nyx nyx oh yeah nyx is a really great brand okay so this is all as you would probably assume rachel's yeah i need you to do it like a makeup youtuber where you put your hand behind it and you hold it up like this yes perfect cool amazing and then I also have, let's see, what is this? This is real shiny, so it's hard to read. Cabaret Premier Artistic Volume Mascara. Okay. Which I guess, because it's volume, I should say it loud. It's volume mascara. <laughs> Jarek's going to love that. Yeah, well, that's what I do. Max that gain. Have you ever had mascara on before? Very occasionally when we're doing NSP stuff or a makeup person, I'm pretty minimal for very obvious reasons. So yeah. they'll usually just do a little pat on my forehead, nose area, but very occasionally they'll put maybe just a little bit to poof up my eyebrows. But as Rachel says, tell me if this is your experience. She's like, because you never wear mascara, you have great eyelashes. So I have like pretty poofy or whatever eyelashes. So I think they stand out pretty well anyway. Yeah. I also find the mascara is the hardest part if you're doing makeup on someone who doesn't wear makeup. This might not be a good time for you. It does not feel good when you're not used oh, to it. I hate having shit near my eyes. Great. So this is perfect for you. Great. All right, let's do All it. All right. So what are you going to do? You're going to uncap your liner. The thin one. Yes. Okay. So basically with eyeliner, there are a lot of shapes that you can do, but what's going to flatter you best is you're essentially extending the bottom of your eye. You're matching the angle. So what you're going to want to do is make a little acute angle so you can look like a cute angel. Wait, acute angle as in point where it's like pointing into the eye on the side? Is that what you're talking about? This is the shape that you Coming want. Coming out of the eye. Yes. And so the best way to do that, you would think that going like this would be the best way, but mm -hmm. it's actually, you want to stabilize your arm. It's helpful to put your pinky down okay. and you're just going to draw, trying to get that okay. angle with your lower lid and pull it out. I wouldn't go further than like the edge of your brow. I feel like I'm doing this very dark. Yeah. You're extending it from the lower. You kind of want it all sitting on your upper lid. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> I can, I'm crushing this, I'm sure. Yeah, you're doing perfect. And you're super pixelated, so I can't even tell. I just see a large mass. Okay, great. Yeah, I can tell I did that really well. So you do it again on the other eye. With the same hand? Do you switch hands? Usually I don't. Okay. You're putting it real low. <laughs> well, I'm going to do what you told me to. Oh, yeah, it's less than. Yeah, and you might want to pull it like to the center, usually like right above your iris is where I stop it. But if you want to go for oh, a wow. real scene look, you can take it to the inner eye. Do I do it on my eyelid? Yeah, it's kind of the whole point of the, the exercise. Great. It seems amazing. Great. Do you feel like you got good coverage? Have you filled it yeah, in? You know what? I'll text you a picture. I know it's good. I mean, the question is, how good is it? Do you feel pretty? Yes. You don't need makeup to feel pretty, Brian. That was no, a test. No, I do not. Yep. Okay, we're downloading. <laughs> you look amazing. Yep. Actually, it's a very like mod look in the 60s. You know, there was a lot of experimentation. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was going for. Yeah. I like the wet look. The wet look. Yeah. Yeah. A thing that you can do is you can put like lip gloss on your lid. People generally, you don't want to do that because you've got mouth yeah. germs and you don't want to put it on your eye, but it looks pretty cool. My mouth is, by the way, famously clean, my mouth. So true, especially after you drink piss. Hell yeah. Well, I actually, the new thing I've been doing, I have a piss ivermectin cocktail I've been experimenting <laughs> with. It's really delicious. Homeopathic. No, it's not diluted at all. It's like the opposite of homeopathic. Like, you can really taste the ivermectin. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you're thoroughly dewormed. Hell yeah, I am. 
Okay, so we're going to take your little mascara wand out. You're going to look down. And what you want to do is, let's start with the top. You're going to do a little sawing motion as you oh, pull God, I up. Oh, hate this. Now, yeah, isn't it the worst? Okay. That's the stuff. All right, you do the other eye. How do I know I'm getting shit on my eye? Because you kind of want to pull it right to your upper waterline and pull out. So you're like coating your lashes. Are you doing your lower eye now? Yeah. You want to look up and just kind of gently touch it. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, what an awful feeling. Oh, yeah. Oh, buddy, you're not even on the eyelash curler shit, which is the real medieval torture device of it all. Oh, that thing. I've seen those. Yeah. Do you use those? Yeah, every day. I do a hard crimp before I put the mascara on. Mm -hmm. And then as it's drying, this is my trick. As it's drying, I hold it up with a closed mm -hmm. eyelash curler. So it's like getting set in that real curled position. Wow. The hard crimp was my finishing move when I wrestled. <laughs> okay. This one's coming on. That's the upper left eye. And then... I'm going to look up when you're doing the lower lash. Oh, shit. I looked up when I was doing the upper one, too. Oh, God. I got the lid. Oh, I hit this. Okay. Yeah, it I does not it. feel good. I'm going to text you another picture. Okay. Of myself like this. This does come off, right? Uh, it's permanent. Cool. I tried to open my eyes real wide. Wow, I look deranged <laughs> in this picture. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, Christ. Look at this. That's a zaddy. We're downloading. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> and I just did my eye makeup flawlessly. Yeah, A+. plus. Folks at home who are not on the Patreon, which you should get on the Patreon, it's impeccable. Like real MUA shit. Yep, that's me. Mwah! And that's how you do your eye makeup. Hell yeah, I learned something new today. Rachel's going to be so impressed. Folks at home who like haven't touched makeup stuff and might think that they might not be into it, you can get clear mascara and clear brow gel. It really makes a difference when you shape things up. Like I've done photo shoots with like guy friends before where you just do a little bit of the brow and a little, little bit of clear mascara. It's a really big difference. It's fun. It makes you feel pretty. All right, shall we segment? Yes. All right, Layton, now this is one-on-one, -on -one, so I do feel like I need to teach you about what this first segment is. <laughs> Don't do this. This is our- Don't do uh, this. It's our brand new, brand new, recently renamed pop culture recommendation segment. This is the part of the show where you get to talk about a book, a movie, a TV show, a video game, something that you've been into recently. And it has a theme song, but it also has a name, which despite my best efforts to call it something different, you brought it back around it's called What's Poppin' and the theme song goes here. What's Poppin'? What's Poppin'? Amazing. That's how you introduce What's Poppin', everybody. Brian, What's Poppin'? This is probably the most obscure thing I have ever recommended in this show. Wow. 15, 20 years ago, I was hanging out with some physics friends in Philly, and they brought me to a show and this guy, Joshua Marcus, was performing. I was like, fuck, this is good. I love this. Well, he wasn't selling anything or something at the time. For whatever reason, I didn't buy his album. Friend sent me a copy of his album later, and it is one of my all-time favorite albums, but I don't know the name of it, <laughs> and I've never been able to find it online. Like, literally, this doesn't exist online in any way I can find. What kind of music? It's very interesting folky music. So it's got banjo. This guy has a very kind of unstable voice. It's really interestingly written. It's not comedic, but it's very like neo-folksy, which is not typically my scene. But there was just something about this guy that I was just like, man, I love the songwriting here. So what I'm going to recommend is another album of his that I also like a lot. I don't like it as much as this other album whose name I don't know but I have listened to probably 200 times start to finish over God the last damn. 20 years. What are some of the song titles? Theme Park Fan is one. You can hear a lot of his stuff. He's on Bandcamp. Oh. So if you look for Joshua Marcus on Bandcamp, the album I'm going to recommend is from 2007. It's called Make Believe, Make Slash Believe. Cute. And it's very cute, very cute title, and you'll get a sense of who this guy is. He's put out a lot of music. He was part of another band, that I also have a few albums from who I think they actually have an album on Bandcamp, but it says 
we wrote this but never released it. Maybe somebody will find this someday. So this other band is called Like Moving Insects. Ooh, I love that name. It's a great name, really interesting band, very folky and weird. But I want to send you this track. This was the soundtrack of my late 20s. Nothing else even comes close. Wow. This was it. I also, one time I was in Philly giving a talk and I was like, I wonder if my favorite musician is going to be performing. And he was. And it was in this weird little cafe. It was like sit on cushions on the floor for 20 people. And he did some of his songs. It was just such a odd but perfect coincidence that this guy whose music I loved, who is not very well known, but has been so profoundly influential to me, not even in my writing. I don't write music like this at all. Never have, never will. But this guy altered my brain chemistry for years. And I love his music and I wish more people knew it. Awesome. I'm excited to listen to this. Ooh, I'm loving this banjo. Underrated instrument. Very fun voice. Yeah, very unstable. It's like voice. It's like rickety. Yeah. It's not on YouTube. As far as I know, it's not on Bandcamp. I can't find this fucking thing anywhere. But it is probably one of my top 10 favorite pieces of music. Yeah, it's it's the vocals are very like Jeff Mangum of Neutral Milk Hotel E. Yes. Which I like. All right, what's popping with you? Do you know what a subungual hematoma is? Is that an abdominal thing? No. So it's like a blood blister if you get like a hot and spicy bruise on a toe or a fingernail. Oh, ungual like ungulate. Yeah. Like, okay, got it, got it, got it. So basically the whole thing swells up and you have a whole lot of blood that's trapped under your nail. And one day, forever ago, I was on Reddit, like on one of the gross subreddits or whatever. There was a video of a guy who had a subungual hematoma. And the way that you drain those oh, is God. if you go to a doctor, they have a little tool where the tip of it heats up and you very slowly put a hole in the nail. I got one of them too. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank thank you. You did it. King of comedy right here. I did. Yeah, that's me. But once you get through the hole, because it's like so pressurized in there, it's like the blood squirts out of the hole. And so what's popping for me is subungual hematoma drainage videos, of which there are a lot of on YouTube. Oh my God. There's something so satisfying about somebody being in pain and then suddenly getting like intense relief from it. Mm-hmm. Also, it's crazy to see like, oh, what does the blood do? Because there are some where it squirts out with like the person's heartbeat. Sorry if that's gross, folks. Wow. Okay. Compared to like a pimple popper video, how gross is this? Like way grosser or about the same? I mean, if you have a blood thing, it's way grosser. But I cannot stand pimple popper videos. Those are excruciating to watch for me. Oh, I like them. But I watch like much grosser, nastier shit on a regular basis. I don't know why that's the hard no for me, but I just ugh, can't do it. So yeah, if anybody's interested in seeing that, it's an interesting little hole to go down. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. It's like trepanning a nail. Oh, no. Okay. That's a no for me. (laughs) That's that. I can't can't do that. No. God, I read a book once called Borehole about a guy who like self-trepanated to be high forever. Yeah, no thanks. The title is a lot more accurate to the content of the book because it was a real (laughs) snooze. (laughs) You'd think it'd be interesting, but it was not. All right, time for our final segment, which is called Peaches and Lemons, where we each say three good things and one thing that is a mild bummer or annoyance. Here's the theme song. Peaches and Lemons. Peaches and Lemons. All right, let's do some lems. That's how I say it now. I love it. Little lemmy. My lemon is that I've been loving wearing my new sweatpants. They're great. Mm. But one of the pairs that I got, it doesn't have pockets. Oh, uh, what? Right? Wouldn't you assume Why? that sweatpants have pockets? Like, that's a really fundamental part of yes. sweatpants, especially for middle schoolers, because then they do that thing where they pull the pockets out and they're like, yeah. do you want to kiss a gray rabbit between the ears? Oh, yeah, right. God, middle schoolers are horrible. But yeah, I need somewhere to put my things, such as my keys or phone. It's not even like mm-hmm. jeans or like tighter pants where you yeah. can shove it in there. Or if you have a tight top, often referred to very like, Cis normatively, uh, uh, the Ladies Bank of America is where you shove something in your bra. <laughs> <laughs> your bra, yeah. So, yeah, that's my lemon. I just wish it had pockets. 
one thing Rachel talks about all the time is, you know, you found a good one where you get a dress with pockets. Yeah. And anytime someone compliments it, it's always like, it has pockets. Yes, exactly. Audrey loves her dresses with pockets. She talks about them all the time. It's the best. What's your lemon? My lemon is that, I think I talked about this on the show recently, maybe as a mini episode. I played Diablo 3 for the first time, a game that's been out for 10 years, and I beat it last night. And I was like, okay, what? I'm glad I played it, I guess, but it was tremendously non-satisfying to beat this thing. After a while, it just became a real slog. And maybe I was doing something wrong. Also, it's one of those modern games where there's like, a million things I could be doing in like the inventory or whatever. And I don't know what any of them are or what they do. So I'm like trying to just manage my stuff. And then I discovered there's all these like things where it's like, you don't have enough resources to do this. I never even figured out what it was. So there was a lot going on in the game. Also, there kept being references to season. I just didn't understand what the fuck was happening. I would just explore dungeons, annihilate a bunch of demons And after a while, it just felt like the same mechanic over and over and over and over again. And I wanted to get to the end. I'm assuming the ending is not like narratively satisfying. It's fine. I apologize to people who love this game. To me, it was like the worst example of bullshit names, bullshit item, bullshit quest. Put them in some gobbledygook generator to make up like fantastical or whatever sounding names. Very cookie cutter mythology kind of stuff. And I just did not find it interesting or compelling at all. Like, I'm glad I played it, but it was sort of a waste of time. I don't know. I don't want to shit on games. Like, you know, people obviously put a lot of work into this, and I bet people dearly love this game. And I'm probably missing all the cool parts, to be honest. But it was not as rewarding an experience as I had hoped. It's okay to not like a thing. But the frustrating part is you don't want to not like a thing unfairly, right? You want to not like a thing because you don't like the thing. I feel like I saw the tip of the iceberg and I was like, small fucking iceberg. (laughs) And then is this massive thing underneath it where if you had a icebergologist with you, they'd be like, well, actually, what you're seeing there is really cool because that's the top and it goes under here. And if you do this, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's the frustrating part is I feel like it's probably very likely that I'm missing all the really cool stuff about this game. Yeah. And there's a million cool things that I just didn't do. And that's the frustrating part is I don't want to dislike something when, when you were missing a part of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Or doing it quote unquote wrong, you know? So yeah, that's my lemon. I was like, huh, that was two weeks down. (laughs) That's very relatable. Yeah. Games are too complicated. They're too complicated. Oh buddy, believe me, 70 hours into Civ six. Yeah. Well, Yikers. But those fat adjacency bonuses, man, that's satisfying. I don't know if it's just a me thing or whatever, but people were fucking raving about Monster Hunter Rise. And I started to play it like three times and I could not get into it. So I just feel like either I just don't like that style of video game or I'm doing something so fundamentally (laughs) wrong and dumb that I'm completely missing why they're fun. Which seems to me, honestly, like the more likely thing. Oh, I wanted to ask you, did Audrey see the trailer for Cuphead, the show? I showed it to her when she got home from school the day it came out. And her response was, what? (laughs) She's very excited. We're going to watch it together. It looks pretty cute. It looks pretty cute. I'm excited about it, too. All right. Peach time. time. I'm going to run through mine. My very first one is I'm just feeling like especially grateful to do the various projects I'm doing right now. Like I've landed some pretty great stuff and it's creatively fulfilling and interesting. And I just feel very lucky. That's great. My second peach Sunday, Allison and I went and just did some errands together. Nice. We hit the Home Depot and went to the, the CVS. And I like have a hard time doing errands. It's just like an anxiety thing. Not even COVID anxiety, just like, it's hard for me to get up and get in a car without being like, but what if I crash and die? So I do it with a friend and I love Allison and I love hanging out with her. And it's just fun and cool. That's great. And my last peach is that for our Patreon, we finally did a thing that we've been Ooh. saying we were going to do, Uh-oh. which is you, me, and Jory watch the first episode of The Sopranos. Jory Gabagool Griffiths. <laughs> As he's known yes. to friends. 
but we did a little before and after discussion. And I didn't think we were going to do commentary over the episode, but I got to say pretty fire (laughs) or at the very least very fun. Yeah. I thought we would start it and then cut it, but no, we're keeping that shit in. Yeah, great. absolutely. Really good stuff. I can't wait to watch more of it. I think it should be up before this episode comes out. So Amazing. if you're on our Patreon, you can watch The Sopranos along with us. We just did the first episode, as Layden said, but we're going to keep doing more. Yeah. We also had a fun discussion about like Breaking Bad at the end, which yes. talking to Jory about TV and movie stuff is like one of my most favorite things in the world. Yeah. He's so smart. He's so smart. Every time I talk to him about TV stuff, I'm like, man, I wish I could be that smart. It's like, God, you are so right. You are so correct. Especially because he has such spicy takes and they're always like, God damn it, you're on point. Yeah, totally. And like so well read in media. Anyway, those are my peaches. Hooray, friendship and job. What about you, Brian? All right, my peaches. Due to COVID bullshit, I had a doctor's appointment for contacts. So I need to get new contacts. And I scheduled it like a month and a half in advance. The day before they call me, they're like, oh, yeah, that doctor's sick. Let's reschedule. It's another two months. I was like, fuck, I need my contacts, <laughs> goddammit. But what can you do? I called them today, and they were like, oh, yeah, actually coming tomorrow. So this appointment I thought I'd have to wait a long time for, and I just called at the right time, and I got in, which is nice. So I'm going to be able to see. Lovely. Peach number two, Audrey likes logic puzzles. And we've been doing logic puzzles together, all different types. The grid kind where it's like you have to figure out who came in what place in the fashion show and that we've been doing some pixel paint ones, if you know those. They basically, it's like a grid and they give you on the rows and columns numbers, integers, and those are the number of consecutive squares that are filled in with some indeterminate number of spaces between them. Like a pick cross. Yes. They're called a million different things. Audrey... I taught her how to do one this morning. I woke her up for school. She was in a grumpy, horrible mood, just like Monday morning, man. And then I was like, look at this new type of logic puzzle. And she instantly like perked up and we did like four of them together. And she was so excited. A little preschool game in is always the best. Just get a little bit in. It's the best. We got her this book, which is like, this is for 10 to 14 year olds. And she's like crushing them. I like watching her little brain work. She's so smart and she's just so fun. And so she's got that, Little kid enthusiasm, which is great. Daddy, did you know? Did, wait, this is, has to be the four here because it can't be over there. Like it, it's it's great. Doing a logic puzzle is a really rewarding feeling. I told her I was like, this is how it feels to do science. So it's, you know. And finally, uh, final peach. I was out running errands today, and I was like, eh, you know what? I am going to get some Japanese curry and eat it in a park. And that is what I did. I went to Coco Ichibanya in Santa Monica. Got some takeout pork katsu and found a nearby park, sat down and ate some slightly too spicy, but that was good curry. It was rad. Uh, That sounds amazing. You know who makes extremely fire chicken katsu? I do not. Jarek. Oh, shit. Right. He very sweetly made me and a couple of other people and hand delivered it. And it was just so, so delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Those are my peaches. Awesome. Well, that's late in night 101. How oh, yeah. would you close out a class? Usually I would say, well, oh, sh- so, oh my God, we're over time. I'm so sorry. Just remember the homework is due on the 14th by 4 p.m. Has to be in the mailbox by then. The grader is going to collect it at 4.30. So really get it in by four. All the time in England, I would be like, people, please show up to my office hours. Like, I want to talk to you. Come talk to me about problems you're having. Like, I want to talk physics to you. I am available. I feel like that's universal. People do not go to office hours. It was better in the States, but in England, it was the same kids pretty much all the time. And I love talking to them. But I was just like, guys, there's, you know, whatever, 100 students in this class, three people show up for office hours. Come talk to me. And then I would say, praise God and everything that he gives us, all his many, many blessings, which uh, include my lecture today. And thank you. That's wonderful. I'd like to assign a little homework oh, yeah. uh, do that. to people listening to this episode. So just take care of yourself. Do something kind for someone else. If you love somebody, let them know that you're thinking about them. Maybe reach out to someone you haven't talked to in a while. Yeah. Just do something nice and, you know, get yourself a little treat. And a treat can be, you know, a walk in the park, get a little, little ice cream, mm-hmm. whatever. Just be safe. 
take care of yourselves, take care of other people. And that's due on Monday at 8 a.m. And then never do it again. Yeah, just the one time because I asked you to. All right, stay in school, folks. Hell yeah. See you next time. That's the end of the episode. Great. I'm not saying the come thing. Stay in school and come hard. Bye. Late Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore night, or email us at LeightonKnight at gmail.com.